Throughout history, many societies have used tarring and feathering for both punishment and humiliation. The practice reaches as far back as the 12th century, and despite the fact that most people associate the ritual with the late 18th century, the last known instance occurred as recently as 1981. So, today we're going to take a look at the brutal history behind tarring and feathering. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know in the comments below what other historical punishments you would like to hear about. Okay, these feathers were not meant to fly. King Richard I of England, also known as Richard the Lionheart, was an exalted ruler who held the throne from 1189 until his death 10 years later. Considered a chivalrous king, he was well liked by his kingdom. He also developed a reputation as a great military leader, becoming a principal commander of the Third Crusade and even winning victories against the legendary Saladin. He was the first person to ever be documented as threatening to have someone tarred and feathered as a punishment. The relevant language comes from an order Richard gave his troops as they were headed to the Holy Land on a crusade in 1189. On the subject of thieves being discovered on his ships, the king declared that he shall first be shaved, then boiling pitch shall be poured upon his head, and a cushion of feathers shook over it, so that he may be publicly known. And at the first land where the ships put in, he shall be cast on shore. Well, that does sound like a cruel punishment. You have to admit, that man was an innovator. Whether they were really original to him or not, King Richard's ideas about the use of tarring and feathering as a punishment must have struck a chord with his people, because they were still using the process hundreds of years later. In 1623, a group of nuns and priests were subjected to the procedure. Since members of religious orders were highly esteemed in past centuries, they were punished severely for behaving outside of their prescribed boundaries. Although little is known about the incident itself, they were apparently tarred and feathered for public drunkenness. On the say-so of the Bishop of Halverstade, records show that in 1696, a London bailiff who was attempting to serve process on a debtor was tarred and feathered for his trouble. Tarring and feathering a debt collector? I think I get it. The English liked tarring and feathering so much, they brought it with them to the Americas, where it became a popular form of protest in the 18th century. Take the case of Captain William Smith, who was accused of ratting out smugglers to British customs authorities. Smith was hunted down by a Virginia mob, who tarred and feathered him, and then threw him in the harbor. And there are many such incidents. Why was tarring and feathering so popular in colonial times? Well, it was greatly a matter of convenience. The average American pillow was filled with feathers, and tar was also readily available, since pine tar was used as a common sealant in most shipyards. As the necessary materials were easily available to the average citizen, tarring and feathering quickly became a favorite method of punishment and humiliation among the colonists. This was especially true after the passing of the Stamp Act, when the colonists turned their outrage on British officials regularly. Another reason behind the widespread embrace of tarring and feathering was that contrary to popular belief, it was not fatal. The survival rate was actually very high, even if the punishment itself was slow, brutal, and incredibly embarrassing. In fact, there is no record of a person dying from the punishment during the entire American colonial era. Today, when you hear tar, you probably think of asphalt. But in the times of the colonists, tar referred to pine tar, or resin, which is a glue-like material that was also known as pitch. Pine tar can be procured when pine wood is heated to extremely high temperatures in a low oxygen environment. This process turns the resin into a carbonized and incredibly sticky substance. Pine tar was widely used on wooden sailing ships as a sealant and wood preservative. Today, it's used in products like shampoo and skin treatments, and by professional baseball players. Pine tar is also the easiest phrase you can say to make Kansas City Royal George Brett angry. The assumption that tarring was an extremely hot and painful process stems from the modern association of tar with asphalt. In fact, asphalt must be heated to a much higher temperature than pine tar in order to reach a pliable state. The difference is about 300 degrees Fahrenheit versus 140 degrees Fahrenheit. The point being, pine tar would generally not cause any lasting damage from burns. That being said, it was hot enough to cause some damage. A judge named Peter Oliver once observed a man being tarred and feathered and said, hot pitch was poured upon him, which blistered his skin. Still, as hot as the pitch could get, 
The most lasting injuries were most likely tied to the victim's reputation and pride. The most common materials used globally for tarring and feathering were, in fact, pine tar and feathers. But when those eponymous ingredients were in short supply, Americans did what they do best. They got creative and began to use other materials they had readily on hand. Some common substitutes in the 1800s were syrup and cattails, which are both food products as opposed to building materials and stuffing. Being syruped and cattailed doesn't quite have the same ring to it as being tarred and feathered. But rhetorical aspects aside, they got the job done. History is replete with stories of people who win the lottery twice. But not everyone is so lucky. Take John Malcolm, a staunch British loyalist and comptroller for the Customs Service, who bore the distinction of being publicly tarred and feathered not just once, but twice. The first incident occurred in Maine in 1773 and became an integral element in Malcolm's local reputation. In this instance, he was being punished by a group of angry sailors. However, it wasn't as bad as it could have been because the attackers applied the tar and feathers over his clothes. The second tarring and feathering occurred in Boston in 1774, after Malcolm was stopped by a local man, George Hughes, for yelling at a boy. Malcolm struck Hughes down with his cane, and a mob soon gathered outside his home, outraged. Instead of caving to the mob, he egged them on, shouting, You say I was tarred and feathered and that it was not done in a proper manner? Damn you, let me see the man that dare do it better. Now, if you think daring an angry mob to do a better job at tarring and feathering you is a bad idea, then congratulations, you're smarter than John Malcolm. He was stripped to the waist, whipped, and beaten before being tarred and feathered for the second time in his life. He was then forced to drink tea until he puked, because at that point, why not? His second punishment was so severe that his skin peeled off in chunks, which he saved in a box to show the king how much he had suffered. After the incident, Malcolm moved back to England, which, all things considered, seemed to make everybody happy. Born in 1830, religious leader Joseph Smith is most famous for being the founder of Mormonism and the Latter-day Saint movement. In his mid-twenties, he published the Book of Mormon, which he claimed he discovered written on gold plates in a language he called Reformed Egyptian. The publication attracted tens of thousands of people to his movement and kick-started what today is a global religion with millions of followers. So, where does the tarring and feathering come in? Well, in the middle of the night on March 24, 1832, Smith was dragged from his bed. Community members were angry about a few things. First off was his supposed plan to take land from them and place it under his own control. But perhaps the most pressing reason for the midnight kidnapping was the accusation that he had been intimate with a young girl in the community. It would feel good to praise the angry mob for their civic mindedness when it came to the protection of children. But during the events described, they also forced Smith's wife and baby from inside the house and a few days later, the baby died from exposure. Smith was badly beaten and covered in tar and feathers, but apparently, the mob failed to make their point. Smith's friends spent the night cleaning him up, and the next morning, despite being wounded and weak, he still preached to his congregation. As previously mentioned, the popularity of tarring and feathering was largely a function of how easy it is to procure tar and feathers. It follows that when something so dangerous is so accessible, it's bound to fall into the hands of the worst kind of people. As such, one prominent example of tarring and feathering involved a high school principal from Willow Run School District, a town located 35 miles west of Detroit in Michigan. The town had a long history of racial tension, and in 1971, just four years after 43 people died in racial riots in nearby Detroit, Dr. R. Wiley Brownlee was kidnapped, tarred, and feathered by the KKK. What did Brownlee do to deserve such an attack? Well, he was a white man who was advocating the public recognition of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. While this example is relatively recent, it's worth pointing out that the Klan had historically used this punishment on African Americans. All good things must come to an end, and all bad things usually peter out eventually too. Tarring and feathering had a good long run that lasted centuries but it now seems to have gone the way of the dodo. The last recorded instance of this fairly horrifying phenomenon happened to one Elizabeth Jameson, who was tarred and feathered on her wedding day in 1981. The ex-wife of her husband-to-be, Marietta McElway, 
was angry that Jameson was proceeding with the wedding in spite of McElway's threats. McElway and her sister essentially held Jameson at gunpoint before chopping off her long hair, stripping her torso, and tiring and feathering her from the waist up. While the attack was no doubt pretty terrifying, it did not succeed in its goal. Determined to carry on with her wedding plans, Jameson recovered from the incident and went forward with the wedding, wearing a short wig to hide her butchered hair and hopefully a good amount of perfume to mask the tar stench. Good for her. We hope it worked out and she got some really great wedding gifts. So what do you think? Why would you tar and feather someone? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.